Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this chance to come together and to study your word. Father, we're grateful for the way that you promised to speak to us through your word and transform us by your word. We ask that you would bless us today as we study. We pray that you would send us your spirit to enlighten us. And Father, we pray that by the spirit's power, you would keep us faithful to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Daniel 10, beginning at verse 1, uh, kind of a big picture uh, view of what's going on in the book of Daniel. We've been through Daniel 1 through 6, and in Daniel 1 through 6, uh, we are essentially in the realm of history there. We're talking about historical narratives, different things that happened, and that's where we get a lot of the big famous stories of Daniel. We get Daniel in the lion's den, and uh, we get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, we get a lot of the beloved stories that you learn in Sunday school, and and then the second half of the book, Daniel 7 through 12, uh, we are now in visions. And so there's kind of a clean break between the first half of Daniel and the second half of Daniel. And so uh, Daniel 7 was a vision, Daniel 8 was a vision, Daniel 9 was a vision, Daniel 10 again is a vision. And uh, notice how Daniel 10 starts. It starts in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. A revelation was given to Daniel who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Um, what's kind of interesting about this is that when we get to Daniel 5 and Daniel 6, uh, we are right at the tail end of the Babylonian Empire and the very beginning of the Persian Empire, and the year here is 539 B.C. But then, as we come to Daniel 7, where the history ends and the visions begin, uh, we kind of back up a little bit, and uh, we go through uh, some different sections of history. Daniel 7, then, begins in the year uh, 553 B.C., Daniel Daniel 8 begins in the year 551 B.C. Daniel 9 begins in the year 539 B.C. And then Daniel 10, we are now in the year 536 B.C. And so, notice how we're kind of resetting the clock from here. Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, and Daniel 10. We started 553, 551, 539. And now we're in the year 536. This is during the reign of Cyrus. And so for these last two chapters, we have been in the reign and in the realm of the Persian Empire. So Daniel has this vision. And notice that he says it is a revelation. Uh, the Hebrew word here for revelation is the word debar. Now, uh, the word debar is often translated as the word, ready? It's translated as the word, word. Okay? So a revelation comes from God. Now, here's what's important about this word, debar, okay? In Greek, it comes to us as the word, logos, which is also a word that is used in John 1, when John says, in the beginning was the what? Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Um, who is the Word in John 1? The Word is... Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus is revelation from God. He's the one who tells us what God is. He's the one who shows us what God is like. He's the one who gives us insight into the mysteries, into the wisdom of God. He is the Devar of God, the Lagos of God, the Word of God, the revelation of God. Now, this is kind of interesting because in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel gets a word, he gets a Devar, and you know who's going to show up in Daniel's vision? One who is like a son of man. Man. Who might that be, ladies? Jesus. Jesus. You see how all of this hangs together? And so, Daniel gets a devar, a word, a revelation, a logos. A revelation was given to Daniel, who's called Belteshazzar. Its message, Hebrew word again, devar, was true. It concerned a great war. We'll come back to what that great war is here in a few moments. The understanding of this message came to Daniel in a vision. Uh, turn to Proverbs 2, verse 6, please. Proverbs 2, verse 6. Go 
notes to read Proverbs 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Um, one of the fundamental teachings of Scripture is that not only does Scripture tell us truth, it also helps us believe that truth. Here's what I mean by that, okay? Um, for many people who study Scripture, they study it, and yet they do not believe it. They don't trust it. This is pretty much all of the liberal theological enterprise in spades, right? Uh, we see scriptural prophecy, and the assumption is you cannot foretell the future, therefore the prophecy cannot really be prophecy, right? Uh, we see Jesus testified to as the Son of God, God come to earth in human flesh. Uh, these people say there's no way that that can be actually true. Jesus must have just been a man because that's not the way that God works. And so there are many people who study scripture, but they do not believe in scripture. They do not understand scripture. This happened even with Jesus. Why do you think he got rejected? Why do you think he got killed? Why do you think he was crucified? Why do you think he was mocked? People need more than just the word to understand the word. They need the spirit. One of my favorite sayings from Martin Luther, without the Holy Spirit, Scripture will always remain a closed book. One of the blessings of us studying the Word of God is that when we believe the Word of God, we realize that we believe the Word of God not by our own strength, not by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Without the Spirit, to believe this book is impossible. Daniel acknowledges this. Daniel receives a vision, but he understands that without the Lord, without the Spirit, without divine help, understanding the word, understanding the devar, believing the devar, is completely impossible for him. That's why he says the understanding of this devar came to him in a vision. Not only does God give him a vision, God also helps him understand the vision. It's kind of like when I was in grade school, I had to read a lot of Shakespeare. You want to know how much of Shakespeare I actually understood? That's okay. They had these things called Cliff's Notes, right? And they helped me understand what in the, word, what in the world uh, Shakespeare was writing. Uh, the Bible, without the Spirit, it's kind of like Shakespeare. Okay, You can try to read it, but you're not really going to get it. The Holy Spirit is the Cliff's Notes. All right? He helps you understand. He helps you believe what exactly is going on in this book. Verse 2. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food. No meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. And so Daniel receives this vision, this vision from God, and his response is mourning. Why do you think Daniel's response would be mourning? Or let's put it another way, okay? We've looked at Daniel 7, we've looked at Daniel 8, we've looked at Daniel 9. Uh, these visions were really cheery and lighthearted, right? Not so much. There's a lot of war, there's a lot of doom, there's a lot of gloom, there's a lot of destruction, there are a lot of battles, right? But we see the evil of this world on display in these visions, and so now Daniel's getting another vision. Do you think this one's going to be particularly cheery, yes or no? No. Okay, this is one of the fundamental um, characteristics of apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature takes, takes a very dim and grim view of the world. If there's one thing you learn about in apocalyptic literature, it is the brokenness of the world. And not only the brokenness of individuals, but the brokenness of world systems as a whole. The brokenness of powers and principalities. We're going to see that uh, here in Daniel 10. It's not just that there's a little something wrong over here and a little something wrong over there that has to be tweaked every once in a while. It's that everything is really messed up. That's, that's one of the big messages of apocalyptic literature. And so Daniel sees this vision and he mourns. Now, how does he respond to this mourning? I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. Um, here's, here's what I want to do. Let's go to, let's go to, what am I looking for here? 
I have it written here somewhere. Let's go to Matthew. Got to find the chapter here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 16. And go to verse 18. Who wants to read that? Matthew 6, beginning at verse 16, going to 18. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to them that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When Daniel receives this vision in Daniel chapter 10, he mourns and he decides that he's going to go on a fast, okay? In verse 3, he says, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over, okay? So he's kind of in this vision uh, state. He mourns for three weeks when he receives this vision. And um, notice that when he fasts, he uses no lotions at all until the three weeks are over. And so not only is Daniel not eating, he's not grooming. In other words, he looks terrible for three weeks. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 that when you fast, you ought to make sure that you don't look terrible. You ought to make sure that, if at all possible, don't announce the fast with trumpets, right? Don't make sure that you walk around somberly going, oh look, I'm fasting. That seems to be exactly what Daniel is doing. Now, here's what I would point out, okay? When it comes to things like fasting, when it comes to things like mourning, one of the things that we see in the Old Testament is an outward expression of grief. This is why when something bad happens, people dress a certain way. Anybody remember how people dress in the Old Testament over and over and over again when something bad really happens? Sackcloth and ashes. So that everybody knows. Grief, the ancients are very comfortable expressing it very outwardly. That is why they weep and that is why they wail. That is why there's an expression that comes up many times in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that has to do with gnashing your teeth. Okay, It is fine when you are in a, a tough situation to outwardly express your grief. What Jesus is talking about in Matthew 6 is not an outward expression, but trying to make an outward impression. And the difference between these two things is worlds apart. Outward expression, this is simply authentic. This is simply real. This is simply not trying to cover something up when something has gone wrong. Not just putting on a happy face and saying it's fine when it's not really fine. In out word impression is when you try to do something to impress other people. It's when you fast and you want other people to be impressed by your piety and so you make sure that you look really, really bad. It's when you pray and you want to make sure that other people know about your eloquence and so you pray out loud for everybody to hear. Remember in Daniel 6, when Daniel is fixing to be thrown into the lion's den, and remember how he goes up to his upper room, he throws open the curtains, he gets down on his knees, and he prays so that everybody can see and everybody can hear? Okay. Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you pray, where should you go? You ought to go into your closet. Shut the door. Okay, why is it that Daniel's allowed to pray in front of everybody, but Jesus says, no, 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 don't pray in front of anybody. It has to do with this, outward expression versus outward impression. What Jesus is teaching against here is trying to impress people. He's not teaching against expressing your faith. Does everybody understand the difference? Okay, sometimes it's good, ladies, to pray in public. Sometimes it's great, ladies, when you're going through a tough time, to be honest about it. 
What is not good are using the things of God to impress other people when it comes to you. You're basically using the things of God. When you fast to impress other people, when you pray to impress other people, you're using the things of God, not for God's glory, but for your glory. And that's the problem in Matthew chapter 6. By the way, that's also the problem that the Pharisees had. Okay? Making an outward impression. This is authentic. This is fundamentally hypocritical because you're pretending to point to God when you're really pointing to yourself. And so Daniel is very honest about what he's doing here in verse 3. Verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, this would be around March or April, okay, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like, was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and his legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Um, Daniel, in this vision, looks up, and he sees a man who is dressed in linen. A uh, few things that I want you to notice. First of all, this man in verse 4 in Hebrew is literally one man. And so he looks up and he sees not a man, not any old man, but one man. There is a single man who immediately rivets Daniel to attention. And he's dressed in linen. Go to Leviticus 6 verse 10. Leviticus 6 verse 10. Who wants to read Leviticus 6, verse 10? The priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen undergarments next to his body and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. Um, here's what I want you to notice. In Leviticus 6, also in Leviticus 16, which is the story of the Day of Atonement, um, the priest wears what kind of garments? He, made, he wears garments that are made out of what? Linen. Linen. Okay, and he wears these garments specifically, very important, okay? He wears these garments and only these garments, like in Leviticus 16, when he is making atonement for sin. He wears simple linen garments. Now, you know that the high priest at other times will wear very fancy garments. When he's making atonement for sin, he wears simple linen garments. Daniel sees one man and he is dressed in linen. Okay, this man seems to have some sort of priestly function. He has a belt of finest gold around his waist, his body was like chrysolite, his face was like lightning, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Now, this is kind of an interesting guy that Daniel sees, and the question is, who is this guy that Daniel sees? Turn to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. And can someone read verses 12 through 15? sheet over. On the back you should see a little chart. We have Daniel 5 or Daniel 10 verses 5 and 6 and then we have Revelation 1 
beginning at verse 13 and going to verse 16. A um, few things that I want you to notice, okay? Uh, we have in Daniel 10 uh, an appearance like a man. Later he is called one like a son of man. In Revelation 1 verse 13, we have someone who is like what? A son of man. Okay, this guy is clothed in linen garments. That kind of gives rise to his priestly function in verse 5. He's wearing a robe in Revelation 1. He has a gold belt around his waist in verse 5 of Daniel 10. He has a gold sash around his chest in verse 13 of Revelation 1. He has a body. Uh, this is kind of interesting. The NIV calls this chrysolite. Um, another uh, gem that you can translate this as is the gem of jasper. All right, in verse 6 of Daniel 10. Now, here's what's kind of interesting. In Revelation 1, there's no reference to his body. But if you turn to Revelation 4, verse 3. Revelation 4, verse 3. What version actually has two paths? Yes. Um, here's, and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you where, that, where that comes from, okay? Um, the, uh, the, the Hebrew word that underlies this is a word that is kind of a general gem word. And so it makes it a little bit tricky because it can refer to many different gems. And so uh, the scholars get into big fights as to exactly what gem it is. So that's, that's why. That's why. Um, so Revelation 4 verse 3. Who wants to read that? The one sitting on the throne was as bright as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. All right, this should be real easy. Who's sitting on the throne in Revelation chapter 4? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, he looks like Jasper in Revelation chapter 4. Uh, you know, when you get to the New Jerusalem, remember the pearly gates and the different stones that are on top of the gates? Uh, one of those stones is the stone of chrysolite. Whatever the case may be, the point is, there's a body that's like a gemstone. It's a brilliant, glorious, wonderful body. Uh, one of the things that I would note is that when the high priest would wear his breastplate, remember, remember with all the different gemstones on it? One of the gemstones was chrysolite. Okay, and so here we have this priest clothed in linen garments who has a body like chrysolite or jasper. Jasper probably refers to what's going on in Revelation. Chrysolite, that's one of the gemstones on the high priest's breastplate. But this guy is such an amazing priest that he not only has a breastplate that is gem-like, his whole body is gem-like. He has a face like lightning in Daniel 10. His face signs like the sun in Revelation 1. He has eyes like burning torches in Daniel 10. He has eyes like flames of fire in Revelation 1. He has arms and feet like polished bronze in Daniel 10. He has feet like polished bronze in Revelation 1. He has, he has a voice like the multitudes in Revelation 10. And he has a voice like many waters in Revelation 1. Here's the idea. Um, these two guys seem awfully similar from Daniel 10 in Revelation 1, don't you think? Okay. And so, who is this man? This man is Jesus. Jesus. Verse 7. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and they hid themselves. Um, this is kind of an interesting way to have a vision, don't you think? Where Daniel's able to see it, but nobody else is able to see it. I want to take you to a couple of places. First one, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Beginning at verse 15. And going to verse 17. Who wants to read that? When a servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, and an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city, Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the 
and the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. All right, um, here's what you need to notice about 2 Kings 6. Elisha is going out with the servants, okay, and um, God is promising Elisha that those who are with Elisha and his side are greater than those who are with the enemy side. Can his servants see that at first, yes or no? No. God has to open his eyes. All right. Let me take you to another place. Acts chapter 9. You've probably read this vision before. Verse 7. Acts chapter 9, verse 7. Saul is trolling along the road to Damascus. Acts 9, verse 7, who wants to read that? Anybody? The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. And Saul, Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And so Saul, he's trolling along the road to Damascus, has a vision of the risen Christ. Um, are the people able? Are the people with him able to see anything? No. They hear something. They don't see anything. Um, one of the interesting things about visions in the New Testament, okay, is that visions seem to be person specific. And in order to see the vision, if you're not the person for whom the vision has been appointed, your eyes have to be open, like in the case of Elisha's servant. Now, one of the reasons this is really, 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 really important is because when it comes to the risen Christ, um, it wasn't just a few people who saw him, it was many people who saw him. Paul talks about how 500 people saw him, how he appeared to hundreds of people at once in 1 Corinthians 15. If they were just having a vision, this wouldn't have been the case. The risen Christ was not a vision, but a stone-cold reality, right? And so here we have this vision. This vision is intended for Daniel. Daniel gets to see the vision. Nobody else gets to see it. But interestingly enough, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it. But then look at the end of verse 7. But such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and they hid themselves. These guys, they don't get to see what's going on, but there's kind of a sixth sense when it comes to the divine, right? This idea that something big is going on. Verse 8, so I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and on my knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully. The words that I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Daniel, when he sees this vision, he falls down on his hands and on his knees, and he hears a voice that says, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed. I want you to pick up on that phrase, highly esteemed. Daniel, uh, this is a word that, that kind of means valued. Daniel is highly valued, and Daniel is valued for two reasons, okay? First reason he's highly valued is because he's a human being made in the image of God. Second reason he is highly valued is because of the grace of God. Uh, you may remember this when an angel appears to Mary, she says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. Okay, the old Latin Vulgate translates this. Uh, this is where the Roman Catholics get it from. Hail Mary, full of grace. Okay, that's really not a good translation of that. Uh, being highly favored is much better. Uh, it's actually, uh, the way you would literally translate this is, Mary, you are be graced. 
This is kind of a passive way of saying that Mary has received grace. This is Daniel. He's highly esteemed for two reasons. First of all, he's a creation of God. He's created in the image of God. Second of all, he's a man who is a recipient of the grace of God because if he was not a recipient of the grace of God, he could not be having these visions and still be alive because you cannot see God or the Son of God and live. And so Daniel is a highly esteemed man, not because of what he has done, but because of, well, who he is according to God. He's a creature of God, he's made in the image of God, and he's received grace from God. Yes? Jesus who is talking to him now, or is this an angel that fought demons over principalities? This seems to be Jesus who is talking to him now. And, and we'll, get, we'll get to an angel. There is an angel in this chapter. His name is Michael. Anybody ever heard of him? Okay. He's an archangel. And so he said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. Okay, so notice how uh, this is Jesus, and Jesus has been sent to Daniel, uh, presumably by the Father. And remember how in John 20, uh, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I, or I'm sorry, I send you the Holy Spirit, even as the Father has sent me. Verse 12. Then the Son of Man continued, Do not be afraid. Why would, why would this man continue by saying, Do not be afraid? Real simple answer to this. Daniel's terrorized. <laughs> yeah. Every single time somebody sees the Lord, what happens? They're afraid. Genesis 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield and your very great reward. Judges 6, verses 22 and 23. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. Revelation 1, verse 17. John says, When I saw God, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. You know what the number one reaction to seeing God is terror. Terror. This is something that's important to remember because not only is God our friend, God is also our ruler. He's our king. He's our creator. Not only is God close to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ, he's also separate, holy, majestic, higher than us. Some people wish that they could see God to know whether or not he exists. I would suggest that if you saw God, it would be a very bad day. Or at least a very scary day. There are a million other uh, less devastating ways to know that God exists. And one of the testaments and the testimonies that we have of the grace of God is that he does, just doesn't rip open heaven and scare us to death. Rather, he gives us clues for his existence, like in his word, like in his creation. The heavens declare the glories of God, the psalmist says, so that we don't have to be terrorized by a bare bones revelation of God. This is why when people get a bare bones revelation of God, just ask Isaiah 6. Their first reaction is not, oh, this is cool. Their first reaction is, whoa, I am ruined. And so, the next time that somebody complains about not receiving the sign that they want from God, not being sure as to whether or not God exists, remember, even that, even the fact that God just doesn't rip open heaven, is kind of a testament to His grace. Because when He does rip open heaven, and He does sometimes, like in Daniel 10, it's usually just really scary. And so, verse 12. The Son of Man continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Notice, notice what this man calls Daniel's God. He calls him your God. 
Now, we've talked about this before in Daniel's chapter 1 through 6. Nebuchadnezzar will often call Daniel's God your God, but what we really want Nebuchadnezzar to call Daniel's God is my God, his God, because he needs to be the one to believe in God. We have this man who's standing before Daniel, and he doesn't call God my God. He calls God your God, Daniel. You know why this man calls God Daniel's God rather than his God? Because the man who is speaking to Daniel is God. He's not my God. He can't call him my God because he is God. And so, you've set your mind to gain understanding, to humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Um, here's what's going on. Remember, this whole chapter takes place in 536 B.C. at the height of the Persian Empire. And so we have the Son of God who's fighting the what? Prince of Persia. This gets back to another uh, fundamental characteristic of apocalyptic literature. Are the powers and principalities of this world in apocalyptic literature, are they good or are they bad? They are bad. They're very, very bad. They are things that are to be defeated in apocalyptic literature. Now, the question becomes why? Turn to Romans 13 for just a second. Let's just read verses 1 and 2. Who wants to read verses 1 and 2? Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. All right, so Paul says in Romans 13, here's what I want you to do with the governing authorities. I want you to submit to them because the governing authorities have been established by God. In Daniel chapter 10, we have a governing authority like the Persian Empire, and the Son of Man is trying to come and conquer him. Now, how can something that is instituted by God be conquered by God? Doesn't that seem kind of strange? You guys remember the Assyrian Empire, right? Who, who sent the Assyrian Empire to conquer Israel? God. Who sent the Babylonian Empire to conquer Israel again? God. Who conquered the Assyrians, ultimately? God. Who conquered the Babylonians, ultimately? God. Why? Because just like the Israelites were sinful and God judged them, the Assyrians and the Babylonians were sinful and God judged them. The same is true with the Persians. The same is true with the Greeks. The same is true with the Romans. The same is true with any empire on this earth. Here's what you need to understand, okay, about Christians and about Christianity. Um, the best way to live with the empires of this world is with a re healthy respect and a big dose of skepticism. I'm serious. You need both. Because God himself kind of has a love-hate relationship with the empires of this world. He institutes them. They can do a lot of good. They can bring a lot of order. Okay? That's why we are called to respect them, right? But at the same time, can they also do a lot of evil? Yes or no? Yes. History is littered with examples of this. And so at the same time that God institutes them, he finally overtakes them. Just read Revelation. It's all about how God overtakes all the kingdoms of this world because the kingdom of God is finally where it's at. That's the same tension that we live with. And so we can fall into one of two opposite extremes, okay? On the one hand, we can get way too cozy with the rulers of this world. It can be all about... Getting into power, maintaining power, holding power, being in power. We can love that kind of stuff. 
that's dangerous. Because we know that at the end, the powers and principalities of this world go, right? On the other hand, we can live with an absolute hatred toward the powers of this world, wanting to see them all fall apart and refusing to respect them. Is that good? No, because Romans 13 tells us that God has instituted the powers of this world. We live in a very tenuous relationship with the powers of this world. We know that God will conquer them, but we know that it's not our job to conquer them. It's God's job. We, in the meantime, are called to respect them. Does everybody understand that? This is incredibly important. It's also incredibly practical. Because it actually gives us a little bit of insight into how we interact with the powers of this world. We respect them, we pray for them, but we also remember that the powers of this world is not where it's at. Because it's a funny thing about human power. You guys know the old saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. The powers of this world, just give them enough time, just give them enough power, and you know what happens? They become corrupt. That's why the powers of this world constantly come and go. That's why different kingdoms constantly rise and fall. There's only one power who has absolute power who will never become corrupt because it is the very epitome of righteousness, and that is the power of God. And so, here's Daniel and Daniel 10. He has this version. Uh, he has this vision. And the Son of Man is fighting the powers of this world. The prince of the Persian kingdom. And the prince of the Persian kingdom is trying to hold on to power, and so he's resisting. They get into this 21-day fight. Um, is the 21 days of any particular significance? Not really that I can tell. You can try to play a few math games with it, but as we've talked about in this kind of literature before, it's very difficult uh, to try to play a lot of math games in apocalyptic literature. And so they get into this fight for 21 days, then Michael Michael, an archangel, he's a prince too, one of the chief princes not of earth, but of heaven. He came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Here's the son of God. Here's one like a son of man. He's getting into a fight with the prince of Persia and the son of God needs backup. Doesn't that seem weird? This is actually one of the reasons that some scholars have said there is no way that this could be the son of God. There's no way that the son of God would ever need backup. He's the son of God for crying out loud. Okay, Matthew 4, verse 11. Let's turn there. This is after Jesus has gotten through for fasting. For 40 days and 40 nights, at the end of that time, he's tempted by the devil. Matthew 4, verse 11 says, who wants to read it? All right. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Let's turn to Luke 22, verse 43. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then Luke 22, verse 43. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Now, here we have the Son of God. And in Matthew 4, in Luke 22, we have angels coming to him and helping out the Son of God. This seems kind of strange, right? He's the Son of God. Why would he need divine help? Okay. Um, does Jesus need divine help per se? No. However, has he created a whole heavenly host of angels? Yes. Okay, is it because he needs them because he somehow doesn't have all the power in the world? No. Does he, however, joyfully use what he has created? Yes. 
It's a funny thing about God. God is all-powerful. He doesn't need our help, but he's also not arrogant. He takes it. That's one of the reasons that we're called God's servants, right? That's one of the reasons that he gives us the responsibility of being caretakers of this creation. Does he need us to be caretakers of this creation? No. Does he take us as caretakers of this creation? Yes. This is really the gospel, okay? God doesn't need our help, but he's humble enough to use us in his service. Yes? One of the things I was thinking about is... Do you think there could be any connection with Jesus' death? He overcame death and the power of the devil, and that's when he doesn't need, uh, he doesn't ask the, maybe the angels after that to strengthen him? Well, I, 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 would, I would only say there is, you, you need to be a, a little bit careful there, because the omnipotence of God is one of those eternal attributes. Okay, it's not like he didn't have it before he died on the cross. He had it before, he had it after, he's always had it. He never lost all the power, and yet one of the things that we learn is that even if he has all the power, um, interestingly enough, he doesn't always use all the power. Have you ever noticed that? By the way, that's good news. Because if he had all the power, you know what would happen to us? Or, I mean, if he used, I'm sorry, he does have all the power. If he used all the power, you know what would happen to us? And so here's what God tends to do. He tends to use his attributes sparingly according to his primary attribute, which is grace. He could wipe us off the face of the map, but he waits patiently. Because his primary attribute is grace. And so, he makes these angels, he makes these ministers, and you know what? He doesn't need them, but he uses them. Because he's made them. He doesn't need us to worship, but he'll use us to worship because he's made us to worship. And by the way, um, he also loves us, so he wants us to serve him, to love him, to be his ambassadors. All of the callings that we have on our life is not because he needs us to do a thing for him. But he puts a calling on our life because he loves us. It's the same with, same with Michael. Verse 14. I've come to explain to you what's going to happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground, and I was speechless. Then one who looked like a man, a better way to translate that is one who looked like the Son of Man, touched my lips, opened my mouth, and I began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I'm overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I'm helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Verse 18, again, one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man, highly esteemed, he said. Be peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened, and I said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. A few things here that I want you to notice about this particular vision. First thing that I want you to notice is that constantly, um, this, this Son of Man is touching Daniel's lips. Verse 16, one who looked like a man touched my lips. Verse 18, again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Um, let's go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. Starting at verse 5 and going through verse 7. Who wants to read those verses? Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew yep. to me with a live coal in his hand, 
which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Um, Isaiah sees the throne room of the living God and he says, Woe to me, I'm ruined. My eyes have seen the living God. This is why you don't want heaven to be ripped open and to see God because it's a terrifying experience. And his sin is atoned for by an angel bringing a coal to him and touching his what? Touching his lips. Okay, one of my favorite hymns. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. Ever heard this hymn before? And with fear and trembling stand, ponder nothing earthly minded. I love that first line. Um, Let all mortal flesh keep silence. Our lips, our mouths, our tongues are sinful and fallen and broken. Paul says, Isaiah says too, we have the poison of vipers that is on our lips. God can speak words of purity to us without our mouths being cleansed. We cannot speak to God, which makes prayer a tremendous privilege, doesn't it? Because that means that God has cleansed our lips. It means that God has cleansed our mouths through His Son. That's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that we pray in Jesus' name. That's one of the reasons why David will pray, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable or pleasing in your sight, my God, my rock, and my Redeemer. David knows that that apart from the Spirit, apart from God's forgiveness, his words are awful with the Spirit, with God's forgiveness. God graciously receives his words. Daniel has this vision and he knows that all mortal flesh ought to keep silence in the presence of God. And yet Daniel's able to have a conversation with God because his lips have been cleansed. And so God speaks, Daniel's strengthened, and Daniel says, Speak, my Lord, since you've given me strength. Verse 20, I love this. So he said, Do you know why I've come to you? Daniel answered. No, Daniel doesn't answer because, well, God answers for him. Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. That was a rhetorical question. Do you know why I've come to you? And then he answers his own question. Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Okay, here's kind of the trouble with this particular vision. We have the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia gets fought and conquered. After him comes the prince of Greece. So we go from one bad power to another bad power. This is really kind of where this vision ends. We have one power that is overtaken by another power. One source of evil that is overtaken by another source of evil. It just evil upon evil upon evil upon evil. This is why Daniel is so troubled when he first sees this vision. But first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. Now, this is where chapter 10 ends. And we're going to get to kind of the balance of what's going on in chapter 10 as we head on into chapter 11. More evil kings, more wickedness, more terribleness. But this is where chapter 10 ends with nobody supports me against all of these evil kings, all of these evil princes except Michael who is your prince. And so here's the picture. It's Jesus and Michael against the world. That's the picture that Daniel 10 leaves us with. A little bit of good and a whole lot of evil. Now, this is the way for a long time that the world has been ever since sin. A little bit of good and a whole lot of evil. And one of the reasons that these visions are so troubling to Daniel and even to a lot of people even today is because they do look so dark and they do look so dim and they do look so grim. They look like there's a lot of evil versus a little bit of good. And the concern is how in the world are we going to be able to stand this evil? Now the answer to that comes in Daniel 12. 
But first, we've got to make it through Daniel 11. We'll talk about Daniel 11 here in, in a couple of weeks. How does a little bit of good overcome so much evil? Now, if you want to know how, read the story of, oh, I don't know, Gideon. Or if you want to know how, read the story of, mm, I don't know, Noah. Or if you want to know how, read the story of, uh, I don't know, maybe Abraham. Time and time and time again, this is one of the beautiful promises that we have. Even when evil looks big and good looks small, you know what always manages to win? Good. It's two against the world. Now, later in the Bible, it's going to be one against the world. Because even Michael is doing other things when Jesus is on the cross. And yet, good wins. You see, there is the quantitative force of evil. Evil has a lot. But there is the qualitative force of good. Good has God. And the quantitative force of evil is never any match for the qualitative force of good. That's the gospel. Good may seem little, but the quality of God's goodness is so much better than even the quantity of the world's evil. And that, ladies, is why these visions should not concern us. That, ladies, is why these visions should not scare us. Because just like, just like in that passage that we read from Elisha, those who are with us are greater. They're of better quality than those who are with them. And so, one of the things that we need to remember when the world looks evil and dark and dim and grim, when all the stats say, like, faithlessness is on the rise, evil is getting more and more quantity, we need to remember that they may have quantity, but we have quality. And in the end, it only takes one to overcome all of this. Yes? things that I guess I hadn't thought about before is Jesus having a body. Yeah. And I thought he got his body when he came to earth, but he had a body already when he appeared in, in several times in Scripture. Well, and there's, there's, a, there's a technical term. There's a technical term for this. It's called a Christophany. And uh, the fancy way to describe this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Um, the incarnation, right? Uh, this is my favorite way to describe the incarnation. I've described it li like this, okay? Um, chili con carne. Anybody ever had chili con carne? Okay, that means chili with what? Meat. Okay, the word became what? John 1 verse 14. Flesh. Okay, God took on flesh. He took on meat. That's what the incarnation is all about, right? God takes on meat. He takes on body. He takes on a flesh. Um, here's, here's, here's what you need to kind of understand about these pre-incarnate uh, visions of Christ. Jesus, you, you can see him, like, like in Daniel 10, okay? And he has what we might call, ha, another fancy word, anthropomorphous characteristics, okay? But we need to be careful that that is probably different from the incarnation. In fact, here's a really easy way that we see it's different from the incarnation, okay? Uh, when people see Jesus in Daniel 10, or when John sees Jesus in Revelation, they're really, really scared. When people see Jesus lying in a manger, they go, Yeah, cute kid. Which will we see? Will we see? Read Revelation. <laughs> I'm serious. Okay, and um, we will see a glorified king. We will see a glorified king who has been crucified, who has risen. Will he have his body? Yes, he ascends bodily into heaven, but it will be a glorified body. This is why, okay, in Daniel 10, Daniel's scared. He sees Jesus in his glory. When Jesus comes to this earth, he gets crucified. Nobody was too scared of him, at least the Romans weren't. 
And so there is a fundamental difference between the incarnated Jesus and like the Jesus we see uh, appearing in the Old Testament. Judy. Do you call this a Christophany? Yes. What's the difference between a Christophany and a Theophany? Okay. Um, Christophany, uh, an appearance of Christ. Theophany, an appearance of God could be Christ, you know, God generally. Theos, God. Uh, Christos, Christ, Jesus. What is the difference? One seems a little bit more specific than the other. When we have one like a son of man, we can pretty safely say, oh yeah, that's Jesus. There are other times where it's just God who appears. All right. Uh, God appears to Abraham. God appears to Moses within the flames of a burning bush type of idea. Uh, and so we'll just say theophany because we don't really get an indication as to specifically what person of the Trinity is showing up. So, any other questions before we wrap up today? Yeah, Judy. Yeah. Does the Lutheran thought end before the rapture? The, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, stops there? Um, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, generally, what I would say is that, yeah, it was the, uh, I'm trying to remember which one I which one I call, it's, it's kind of that preterist viewpoint that, that most of what happens in Daniel 9 is, is fulfilled by the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem within the year AD 70. Okay, so that's, it's kind of a historical look back. Now for Daniel it would be a, a prophetic look forward. Okay, but that it is fulfilled. Most of what Daniel 9 says, what Daniel 9 says is, is done. The problem, the problem with the dispensational premillennial viewpoint is that you have to put a big gap between uh, the part of the prophecy and then there's a big gap and then the, the last seven gets fulfilled at the very end of the world. Quick note on the rapture. When will the rapture happen? There will be a rapture. Anybody know when the rapture will happen? When Jesus comes back. Read 1 Thessalonians, right? The trumpet sounds, the dead are raised, and we are caught up to be with Christ in the clouds. Okay, this is incredibly important because the way that we normally hear about the rapture is like this, okay? People are raptured, Jesus gets a secret return, then we have seven years, then Jesus comes back. 1 Thessalonians doesn't paint it that way. Okay, it's the trumpet sounds, Christ returns. Believe me, when the trumpet sounds, that's not a secret. That's not like, what happened to all those people? So that's, 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 that's important too. Okay, when we use the term rapture, we need to clarify our terms here. Because most of the time when we hear the term rapture, we think, oh yeah, that's that thing that happens where the planes fall out of the sky and the cars go crashing and everybody wonders what happened. No, the rapture happens, but trust me, there will be no confusion as to what happened because, well, Jesus will be returning. And that will be good. Does that, does that, does that help? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word and we're so grateful for your servants, angels. We're so grateful that you have called us to be your servants. And Father, we know that you don't need our help, you don't need our service, but you use us, you use our service out of your love for us because we are your precious children. We're highly esteemed, just like Daniel was highly esteemed. Not because of our works, but because of your grace. Now, Father, may we go about the work that you have given us to do today. May we do it faithfully and well by the power of your Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.